Well, hey, before we get started today, I have a couple of things I want to say. One is um, about the giving to Ukraine. Um, if anyone has questions about that organization or where it's going, let me know. Uh, Josiah Ventures, as Sue said, is a wonderful organization that I know personally, and they have people all along the borders of Ukraine, basically from Poland to Slovakia to Romania, all the way down nationals there, Christians accepting refugees, and the many money we give will go directly towards helping refugees resettle and everything. Uh, and so please take heart in that. If you have questions, let me know. And if you have any, uh, want more information, we'd be happy to provide that. Secondly, let me also thank the musicians here. Um, some of you may have noticed there are a few different band members today. A lot of our women are gone at the women's retreat. And so we just want to say thank you to our uh, extra volunteers who stepped in today. So thank you guys. Appreciate you guys. Um, and then lastly, I want to say thank you to you all. I don't know if you knew this or not. But um, as Grace Community Covenant Church, as, as your pastor, I also wanted to give you what I said in the first service, an attaboy or an attagirl. Um, I want to show you a picture. Yesterday, we had a, a celebration of life here for a young man named Robert King. And uh, his parents are actually here as well, members of our church. Many of you know Mike and Christian. And um, this room was full of people. And I don't know if you know this or not, but if you call this your home church, if you give here, if you volunteer here, if you serve here, if you give some of yourself to make this place possible, it's not just Sundays, that this place becomes a place uh, for the community. A couple of weeks ago, we had a funeral for a community, someone in our community who didn't even go here. They just thought it was pretty and liked the view, and the family said, hey, could we have a memorial service for our mom? And we said, sure, come on in. And so, just so you know, the work the service, the giving, the things we do here is not just to support Sunday morning, but really to support our community and, and, and the world around us. And so I just wanted to, as your pastor, say thank you. Thank you for the work you do, for the giving you give, and the impact it has far beyond uh, the things we see. So thank you all. I really appreciate you. All right, let's get to the Bible. Matthew chapter 26. We're going to be in Matthew today continuing to talk about prayer, and we're going to talk about how to pray. Last week, we talked about praying through the Psalms and some of the things that come with that, and we're going to build a little bit more on how to pray and ways we can pray. And I'm just going to warn you, some of you, um, sometimes if you're the kind of person who's asked to uh, join in with something, if you're at some sort of thing and there's everyone join in, and you sort of sit back and you say, I'm not going to join in. I'm going to warn you, in about 15 minutes, I'm going to ask you to join in with a practice of prayer we're going to do together, and so you can begin to soften your heart, okay? <laughs> we're going to get there. But first, let's read our text, Matthew 26. Uh, we're going to read Matthew 26, verses 36 to 46. This is Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. Starting in verse 36, Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away and prayed a second time, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. And when he came back, he found again them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more, and he prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Okay, so how do we pray? Well, let's look at this passage and learn a little bit from it. Uh, the night Jesus was betrayed, he, uh, he went away to pray with his disciples, and Jesus knew things were going to be tough, right? Uh, we see this throughout Jesus' life. The, after Jesus is baptized, before he goes um, to begin his ministry, what does he do? He spends 40 days praying and fasting in the desert. Before he returns to Jerusalem for the final time, he goes up on the mountaintop in what we call the transfiguration and spends time with God and, and, and with Peter, James, and John again. And then here again, the night, the night he's betrayed, he goes away and prays. And so he says, 
verse 36, to the disciples, hey, you guys sit here and pray. But then he takes those three close ones, right? Peter, James, and John. He takes those three and he says, you guys come with me. And then verse 38, he says, hey, stay up. Remain with me because my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow. I'm sad. I'm hurting. Will you guys please stay with me and pray? Keep watch with me. Stay up. Because serious stuff's about to happen. Verse 39, and Jesus goes, and what does he do? It says he falls with his face to the ground and prays. And when he prays, his prayer is one we probably wouldn't always associate with Jesus. We say, you know, Jesus was a pretty good guy, I think. I think we could all, all agree. And his prayer was, God, I don't want to do this. I mean, it was an honest prayer. We've all prayed, God, I really don't want this. God serves us something, a circumstance in life, something we don't expect. And our response is, I, I don't want that. I, 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 I'm not interested. But then Jesus says something that most of the time we forget to say. Not my will, Lord, yours. And then in verse 40, he returns back to Peter, James, and John and finds them sleeping. He finds them sleeping and says, couldn't you guys stay awake for one hour? <laughs> guys, come on, really? We just had a whole talk about this. You can go back and read. We just had a whole talk about this, how someone's going to betray me, how, you know, Peter, you're going to betray me three times, how Judas is going to betray me, how all of these things are going to happen. Couldn't you stay up and pray? And I love how throughout Scripture we see ourselves reflected in Scripture, right? We see the human condition that this is so honest that, that they just fell asleep. And listen, I'm, you don't have to raise your hand. I know it's true. You know, some of you guys fall asleep in church. Right? I've seen it. I look out there and you see this one. <laughs> I'm with you, Pastor. Okay. All right? I've done it. I fall asleep in church. I've fallen asleep while praying. You know, my brother in law, uh, Chris, if you're watching, hey, Chris. Um, Chris would sometimes fall asleep in church. He'd sit like this. He'd nudge at me. I'm praying. <laughs> you know? We all do it. It's the human condition. But here the disciples are tired, they're worn out. And they just fall asleep. They don't even, they don't pretend they're praying. They just fall asleep. And Jesus says, guys, you need to wake up. And then he specifically says, verse 41, Peter, remember how I just told you you're going to deny me three times? Temptation is coming. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into that temptation, Peter. It's almost like Jesus is saying, hey, Peter, I told you you're going to betray me three times. And by the way, I would love to be wrong. <laughs> Stay up and pray that you don't fall into this trap. And just as a side note, this isn't one of my points for today, but for those of you who ever feel like sin is too much, temptation is too much, it always ropes you in. Like I said a couple of weeks ago, you can always pray. The very words of Jesus, pray that you would not enter into temptation. When you feel like it's too much, pray. And when you can't do it by yourself, get other people to pray with you like Jesus was doing. And so he goes away, verse 42, and he says he went away again and prayed. And what did he pray? He prayed the same thing. Lord, I don't want this. If it's possible for this to be taken away from me, take it. You have served me this cup. I don't want it. And if you would take it away, that would be great. But again, what does Jesus say? May your will be done. It's a scary prayer. And again, he comes back in verse 43, and they're sleeping again. Peter, bless his heart. And they're sleeping again, and so Jesus just says, all right, I'm not going to bug them. What's going to happen is going to happen. I got stuff I got to deal with. I'm not going to worry about teaching them. I need to spend some more time in prayer. And so he goes away a third time and prays, and it says that he prays the same thing. Lord, I don't want it, but if you say so, your will be done. And then he wakes up. Or then he wakes them up and says, well, guys, it's time. My betrayer is here. It's a well-known story. If you've grown up in church, if you've been around churches, if you just come at Easter, you still probably have heard this story. But it reveals some really good stuff for us about prayer. And the three things I want to point out to us about prayer this morning are, are pretty straightforward, but I think they'll be helpful when we talk about how to pray. It's our posture in prayer, our honesty in prayer, which we've talked about before, but it's really important, so we're going to talk about it again, and our commitment to prayer. 
So the first one I want to talk about is posture and practice. What is our posture and practice of prayer? How do we pray? It says that Jesus fell with his face to the ground and prayed. And it's easy to imagine. I'm not going to do it again. I did it with the kids. Hey, on your knees, face on the ground, prostrate as you would before a king when you are giving up all power, all control, and just saying, help. It's a position of humility. It's a physical, it's basically saying if you're humble in your heart, making your body show the feeling of your heart, right? And I don't know if you ever thought about this, and, and, and sure, like I said to the kids, we can pray any way we want. We, I mean, I can pray while jogging. I can pray while rubbing my belly and patting my head. I mean, it doesn't, I mean, the, the, we can always pray, but think about body language and how important it is. Anyone who's ever been trained in communication or listening or anything like that knows how important body language is, right? How many of you ever had a, ever had a conversation with someone where you're pouring your heart out, you're trying to share something, and they just sort of kick back in their chair, cross their arms, and kind of scowl at you? You know they're not listening. You know they don't care. You know they couldn't be whatever. I mean, body language is important. Body language is very important. And I would actually argue, friends, that one of the things I've learned in my own prayer life is that my body posture when I pray helps me in my prayer life. It really does. It, think about your body language with God, honestly. Are you only praying when it's convenient or when you're doing other activities? Are you only praying when it, you know, you're sitting in a nice comfy chair and maybe fall asleep? <laughs> you know... Physical posture can be helpful in prayer. And I learned this um, over the years. And one of the places I learned it is I was uh, in a monastery, actually, in Egypt. I was at a monastery in Egypt, and I remember one of the things they were saying, you know, you can join us for prayers. And I'm thinking, okay, great, a little prayer time, 15, 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, it'll be great. Um, it turns out it's like a three to four hour thing, right? They just pray, and they keep praying, and they keep praying, and they pray a lot. And they don't have comfy chairs like this. They have a concrete floor out in the desert with this nice little woven mat, um, which is great for about 30 seconds. And then your joints and your bones start hurting. And I remember the first 20, 30 minutes just being so focused on my desire to be comfortable. But over time, those things start to fade away. And you try to find a position that is comfortable in prayer, and you realize, at least I did, that a lot of times getting out of those comfortable positions that we're used to really aid in, my, in your prayer life. Can really help make these things real and honest. I mean, entering into, first of all, it's more comfortable that way, but kneeling down and leaning forward, it, it, like, it changes things. Try changing your posture in your prayer life, really. One of the things I do, and I told, showed this with the kids, one of the things I do also that I learned uh, over the years is to receive in prayer by opening my hands. I once had a, a pastor tell me, you know, if you're, all, if you're asking God for things, but your hands are always closed, how could you receive anything, right? It's like if you wanted to take turns, I could throw a baseball to you, and you'd say, who can catch it? If we go to God in prayer, and I know it's just a, a physical representation, and God's going to, but I mean, that just changes things, doesn't it? Say, Lord, I need you. I need your help. This is one of the things we're going to talk about here at the end. So whatever it is you do, whatever practices you bring into your prayer life, whether it's silence or solitude or Lectio Divina or you pray the Psalms like we talked about last week, you do the pray model, the P-R-A-Y that we're doing in our devotional, or some of you do the A-C-T-S, the ACTS model of prayer, whatever we can do, I would encourage you to add posture into your prayer life. Think about how you're sitting, how you're standing, what you're doing with your hands, how you're, you know, what is your body language before God. It might add something to your prayer life. It might not, but I think it will. The second thing I want to talk about that I see here with Jesus is honesty. I've talked about this over and over. I'm going to bring it up over and over again. I love how honest the scriptures are, right? God knows our hearts anyways. Nothing is a surprise to God, so why would we not be honest with God? Think about someone who knows you best in the world, a sibling, a spouse, a best friend, a roommate, whatever. Have you ever gone to them with big information? Like, have you ever gone to someone thinking, this is going to be some earth-shattering news, and you're gearing up, and you're preparing, and then you get them together, and you sort of say, you know, I remember with, with Jenna, my wife, talking 
one time thinking, you know, was years ago when I was getting ready to leave a position, and, and, and it, having a conversation with her where basically I kind of geared up for this thinking it's going to be a huge life change, it's going to be really, really hard, all these things are going to happen, and I remember kind of going to her and saying, you know, I, I, think, I think I'm really unhappy at work and it's time for me to move on. And she sort of looks at me and says, yeah, I know. I said, no, 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 but, but I mean, all these things have changed. And she said, yeah, I know. I've seen it for a while. I was wondering when you were going to bring it up. <laughs> Friend, this is how our God sees us. <laughs> we go to him thinking there's going to be some huge bombshell that he doesn't expect or he doesn't know. And God says, yeah, I know. I love you. And I know. We need to go to God with honesty. Our prayer life needs to be honest. If there is something in our life we don't want, say, I don't want it. If there's something in our life that makes us angry, say, it makes me angry. If there's something in our life that makes us sad, say, God, I'm sad. My soul is sorrowful. Jesus was honest. And I want to encourage you to be honest too. And it's a weird thing to get used to because a lot of us grew up in churches where we had to have all of our stuff together. We had to be all buttoned up and we couldn't pretend that things weren't perfect. We had to look good for our parents. We had to look good for our grandparents because we've always gone to this church and your great-granddad was a Presbyterian minister and you need to... That's not Christianity. Read the Bible. Christianity is honest. It is honest about the human condition. It is honest about the emotional state of our heart. And we need to be honest before God. God knows you're not going to surprise him. I would always tell my, youth, my kids in youth group, at, once you're a youth pastor for a few years, you kind of experience everything. I'd say, you're not going to tell me anything I've never heard before. You can tell me. And I'd still occasionally be like, whoa, I didn't expect that. <laughs> it's another story. But God knows. Even Jesus, our Lord and Savior, prayed three times that it would be taken from him. Peter, the apostle Peter, you know, the first pope, if you want to call him that, the rock of the church, prayed three times that God would take a thorn from his flesh. Honesty is the key. And it's not for God, but it's for us, that we would acknowledge our emotions at any given time. Any single one of us who's been to counseling or knows what it means to be an emotionally healthy adult knows we have to acknowledge our emotions, right? Bury them all you want. We know what happens. Okay, now. Be honest with God. Realize you are not in control. It's okay. <laughs> and then the last thing that's important, I think, in our prayer life is commitment. Um, <laughs> try not to fall asleep. Jesus understands when you're tired, had a big week at work, kids are crazy, whatever. Jesus understands. God understands. But we got to be committed. We have to be committed. Dallas Willard, one of my favorite quotes of all time, and I wish I had written it down. I, forgot, and I remembered it in the first service, and it's not verbatim, but essentially he said, grace is opposed to earning, not effort. We can't earn God's grace, but we can certainly work towards understanding it, work towards accepting it, work towards applying it in our lives. Prayer life takes commitment. If you started a routine of praying this Lent, keep it up past Easter. If you want to start a new routine, don't just try it once or twice and then forget it, but keep it up, keep going, be committed, be disciplined. Commitment is essential to an active prayer life, and I cannot emphasize that enough. Any one of you who've ever tried to eat healthy, <laughs> one day at lunch, I got the salad. I'm doing great. Next day at lunch, ooh, free pizza. <laughs> it's commitment every single day. You know, anyone who's ever, <laughs> we did this once at our house, uh, we tried this horrible diet called Whole30. That someone, it's like to reset everything in your body. And one of the things you can't have is sugar, any sugar. And I had no idea how much sugar was in things. Side note, did you know sugar's in like deli turkey? Sugar's, I, I was just at Sprouts getting some bacon. And, and you're looking at all these different kinds of bacon. I don't know why there's so many kinds, but there's all these different. And then there's one that says no sugar added. Why is that the exception? The no sugar added. But side note, and I tried this diet, Whole30. It's supposed to be 30 days. I did Whole21 because that's how far I made it. But the thing that makes these things hard is we make them habits. We regularly have sugar. We regularly have whatever. We regularly are undisciplined and everything. And habits are hard to break. In the same way, friends, I really believe this. We need to make prayer a habit. Prayer needs to become a habit the same way you do other habits. And we do it. 
Some of you are very disciplined in certain areas of your life, and I know it's possible. Every single one of us has some routine or something that we're very disciplined about. So do not tell me that you can't do it with prayer, because I don't buy it. Okay, and if you, if you can't do it with prayer, that's fine. Then what we'll do is we'll do a special program where I, I call you every single day <laughs> and just say, pray, and hang up. I once had someone who got a little sticker, and it's this little sticker that said pray, and they put it on their watch. And every time they went to look at the time, it said pray, pray, pray all day long. I mean, there are things we can do to help, but I'm trusting that you can do these things, friends, because it's important. And we need to make these things a habit. We need to make these things a habit. So it's about being honest. It's about practicing new postures. It's about being committed. I want to do something with you now. And this is the part where some of you are going to be a little grumpy, but that's okay. Um, we're going to do a little prayer practice now that I love doing. And I've never done it with a large group of people until first service, and I thought it was nice. So I'm going to do it with you all now. Uh, This is something that I've learned that's really helped me. One of the things we do um, when we talk about posture, we talk about honesty, is we hang on to things far too long. Uh, We hang on to hurts, we hang on to pains, we hang on to sadness. Um, And so I want you to start now with this. This is what we're going to do. I want you to start thinking... Um, to use one of my favorite sayings, um, think of something that gets your goat. Think of something that makes you angry. Think of something that really upsets you. Maybe it's something someone said, something people do, something people don't do. Think of something that really kind of makes you want to have a physical response of some kind, whether it's sadness, hurt, it could be anything. And then I want you to sit like this, and I want you to make fists. Close your eyes and make fists. And when I say make a fist, don't just make a fist, but really make a fist. Squeeze your hands tight together as hard as you can. And think of that thing that hurts, that makes you sorrowful, that makes you angry, that makes you confused, that you wish you had an answer to, whatever it is, and make fists with your hands as hard and as tight as you possibly can. And hold that thing. Try as hard as you can to keep clinging your fists together as hard as you possibly can. Now think of the words of Jesus and maybe say them quietly under your breath. Not my will, Lord, but yours. Slowly, slowly unclench your fists. Feel that tension release. Slowly unwind your tight, curled fingers, stretch them out, and say, not my will, Lord, but yours. Rest your hands on top of your legs with your palms open and Feel how tense your whole body has become. Say again the words of Jesus, not my will, Lord, but yours. Allow all the tension to release from your hands your arms, your shoulders, your back. And release that thing. Release that hurt. Not my will, Lord, but yours. And with hands open, ready to receive, Sit in silence now for a moment and receive what the Lord has for you.
not my will, Lord, but yours. Amen. Isn't that kind of interesting? Someone who, totally honest, someone who struggles with frustration and even sometimes anger, it's such a helpful thing for me to do where I realize what that tight tension of holding on to things does to me. And it makes my whole body tense. And yet, when we follow the model of Jesus' prayer and we release our will to his, our posture comes into play, our, our honesty. And if, if, if there's something that you struggle with, I mean, take and use that. Do it every single day if you need to. Maybe at the end of the day, say, pick the thing that bugged you the most in the day and do that exercise again. Um, but know, know that God wants this relationship of prayer with us. God wants to speak to us. God wants to be in relationship with us. God wants you to get this stuff out of your life so that he can give you abundantly. And that's what prayer is about. That's how we pray. You can lay on your face if you want. You can put your hand. I don't care how you do it. But friends, I want you to pray. And I want you to have this part of your life that God would feed you, that God would speak to you. As Jesus said, that he would give us our daily bread, his very body. And that we would remember, if nothing else, what we were just singing, what he says about us. Scripture says that God made everything good. What does that make you? Let's pray. God, thank you. Oh, Lord, thank you for the truth of Scripture and how you love us. Lord, we acknowledge we hold on to stuff too long. We acknowledge we try to hide things from you. We acknowledge we are not committed. We acknowledge, Lord, that sometimes we come to you with a posture that is not full of humility, but pride. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive me. Lord, thank you for the truth of your scripture. Thank you for the very gift of prayer. Lord, I thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit that leads us, that guides us each and every day, that gives us strength and wisdom and courage to live like this, the way we want to live, God. And God, thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ who we get to live this life with. We get to share life. We get to go through it together. Lord, thanks. Lord, teach us all of these things. And Lord, if, if, if nothing else, Lord, just remind us how much you love us. And we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen.